Hello everybody and welcome back to Calivlogs. Today I'm actually really excited for this one because uh, we're going to be talking about Rogue One. Spoiler free of course. I didn't think I was going to get a chance to see this movie until after Christmas, but as a early Christmas present as it turns out, I was able to see the movie. And I would really like to share some of my spoiler free thoughts with everybody. So, uh, where to start? Um, first of all, uh, the simple yes or no question, is the movie a good one? Yes, it is quite good in my opinion. Um, before we delve too deep into it, uh, a lot of people are probably going to wonder, even though they take place entirely different eras, and are really very vastly different movies, is it better than The Force Awakens? In my opinion, no, because I am part of the uh, group of people who loved The Force Awakens. I know it has quite a few haters, or at least people who found it disappointing. I, I did not, but I don't really want to get into a uh, Force Awakens discussion because... That's not the point of this particular video. We're talking about Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which, uh, by the way, for everybody who thinks that the A Star Wars Story subtitle is kind of cheesy, kind of dumb, I know I did, uh, don't worry, it's just for marketing. It's not in the movie. The title in the movie is just Rogue One. So, and, uh, speaking of titles, uh, this isn't a spoiler, um, uh, the head of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy, already stated that this movie would not feature a opening crawl, uh, which is a Star Wars tradition. And I know some fans uh, were kind of put off by that thought. Now, I understand why they didn't do it, and I, for the most part, agree. The reason they're not doing it is because they want to keep the uh, traditional uh, scrolling uh, letters for actual episodes of the saga, and that makes perfect sense. Um, this is a spin-off, it's a side story, it's not part of the saga as a whole, but it is a, a story that is uh, entertaining to see unfold. Now, I'm fine with that. Um, once again, not really a spoiler, the movie does say a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. First. And that makes sense. It's basically uh, an equivalent of saying once upon a time. Uh, it sets the scene, it tells you what, where you're, you know, the story is happening. And that's cool. And it says that, but because it says that, you expect, like, it's instinctual to have that, you know, you know, title. And it, it doesn't do that. So that was kind of jarring. Um, so I'm kind of on the fence. Should they have included the a long time ago, yada yada, or not? Um, that is a minor nitpick. The movie itself I found really entertaining. First of all, the characters. Uh, the characters are fun. A lot of people criticized uh, already that they couldn't grow attached to these characters, you know, um, because a movie really has a very limited time to do this, and it's a one-off movie. They're not gonna do a, you know, a Rogue 2 or Rogue 1 2 or anything like that. It is a standalone story. So the movie had to introduce these characters and sort of give you a feeling, at least, of their backstory. And for a lot of them, that's kind of, especially the, uh, one of the two leads, uh, you don't really get much backstory. Um, and it's kind of the same with, uh, you know, the, the side characters, too. Um, you get glimpses into their backstory, kind of a feeling of who they are, but they can't really devote a lot of time to the characters' um, backstory for development and whatnot, so they really have to work with the time that they have. And in that regard, I think they did a really, really good job. Uh, the main character, Jin, obviously, since she's the main character, you're going to get a lot more of her backstory, and sort of her backstory is integral to the overall plot of the movie. I can't go into too much detail about it. Um, but yeah, she was good, and so was uh, the other lead, the male lead. But I think I agree with most people who say that some of the side characters were actually uh, more entertaining or, or, you know, more fun to watch. Um, you know, you've got the droid character in this movie who's sort of there to provide a comic relief. He's fantastic. Uh, you have the, the blind uh, force worshipper dude who's in the trailers, and he's actually my personal favorite. I think he is awesome. But really, I think all of the characters had awesome moments. Um, and this movie is very action-heavy, and Whereas a saga movie tends to have kind of a lighter side to it. Even even the darker ones, like Revenge of the Sith, um, you know, you have 
that sort of hintings of Star Wars whimsy, or in the case of some of the movies, uh, you know, a lot of whimsy. This is a very grim movie. It's not as dark or as brutal as some critics are saying it is. I still think that it's tamer than Revenge of the Sith. But it's a hell of a lot better than Revenge of the Sith, too. And, uh, you know, as far as the prequels go, I actually really like that one still, in spite of its shortcomings. It tells the story of how the Rebels got the plans to the Death Star in the first place. At the beginning of Episode 4, uh, Princess Leia has the plans to the Death Star and the Tantive IV, the uh, Rebel Blockade Runner, uh, as it's uh, being chased by the Star Destroyer. But uh, this tells the story of how those top secret plans were acquired by the Rebellion in the first place. Now this story's actually been told before in the old canon, uh, which has now been rebranded as Star Wars Legends. Uh, the character Kyle Katarn uh, stole the plans, and you actually got to do that in the video game Dark Forces. Now, going in, even though the movie looked cool from the trailers, that Star Wars fanboy in me was still kind of thinking, well, you know, I really liked Kyle Katarn. You know, I used to pretend I was him at recess at school way, way back in the day. And I, I did like the story of Dark Forces. However, the way they do it in this is much more elaborate, much more um, entertaining, much more interesting, honestly. In the game, you know, as the character Kyle, you, you go into the, uh, the Imperial base, and, you know, you fight some stormtroopers, and, you know, you pull some switches, and finally, you know, once you get to the end of the level, there's the plans. You grab them and done. It's not that easy, and it shouldn't be. This is the Empire. Um, those plans are heavily guarded, obviously. And getting them is quite, quite, a, quite an ordeal for the heroes. Uh, the action in this movie, as I said before, it's it's uh, really action heavy. It is amazing. Um, there are things in this movie which I do like better than some things in The Force Awakens. And, you know, it's vice versa. Force Awakens, I still prefer. Uh, a lot of people think I'm a little easygoing with movies, and I am more easygoing than some. Uh, my wife, Thunder Kitty, has grown actually harder to please with movies uh, over the past few years. And even she thought it was really, really good, and she's more picky than I am. Uh, <laughs> the effects in this movie. The effects in this movie are really good. Uh, the CG characters or things in the movies look pretty much photoreal. The, the droid character, K2SO, he looks like he's really there, and that's really hard to do with CG. Even, even today, it can be difficult. Now, without giving it away, there are at least two, maybe more, characters from the original trilogy who make an appearance in this movie, but the only way that's possible, because this is 30 years later, and yet it takes place, like, you know, days before A New Hope, um, have to be created as CGI characters. Now, do they look perfect? Definitely not perfect. I mean, you look at them, you can tell that's a CG character, but it doesn't detract from the movie for me. Uh, suspension of disbelief, people. Um, it's important sometimes. But anyways, <laughs> Uh, they look pretty good. Uh, when you're sucked into the story, as I was, you start to not think about it as, oh, there's the CG version of that actor playing that character. You're just seeing, oh, there's that character doing what the things that that character does. Uh, this has been revealed in interviews and, 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 you know, press and stuff. Is, uh, and it's kind of a, a no-brainer if you know the story of the Death Star. Peter Cushing returns as Grand Moff Tarkin as a CGI character, because... As we know, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin was very important to the um, story of the Death Star. So, he comes back as a CG character, and all things considered, I think they did a very good job. They did the best I think they could with CG technology to bring him into it. And uh, some people complain he looks like a video game character. I don't think he looks that bad, honestly. This character, um, if any of you have seen Tron Legacy, where they created a younger version of Jeff Bridges for the character Clue, it's a lot like that, except I don't think it looks quite that bad. I mean, that didn't look bad to me when the movie came out, even though it did to some people. It's sort of like the next level. They've, they've improved on the, the technology. It looks better than that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But uh, it did not detract from the movie at all. In fact, that character is very important to the story, as I said earlier. So you have to have them in there. And what they did, you know, really works. Darth Vader. Everybody knows he's in the movie. I won't spoil it, but the scene with Darth Vader is well worth it. 
without saying what happens or giving anything away. I really loved the stuff with Darth Vader in this movie, and it reminds you, for those who have kind of forgotten, because the end of Episode 3 sort of neutered Darth Vader for some people. I, it didn't bother me that much. The no, Cheesy, but Star Wars is a space opera, and it, you know, melodrama is part of that whole genre. But anyways, my god, this scene with Darth Vader is freaking amazing. So, uh, you know, I would go and see the movie just for that. Now, the pacing of the movie, I did say the action is great, and it is. It does start off kind of slow, as a lot of critics uh, and people are realizing and saying. It is a slow build-up. Uh, do I think it's too slow? No, but for some people it might be. My son uh, fell asleep. So, you know, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of stuff that is more interesting, I think, for grown-ups. Uh, it deals a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the wartime sort of morals, you know, ethics, you know, doing the right thing, you know. It deals with, you know, these are these rebels are, they are rebels, you know, they're, they're spies and saboteurs, and, and they've done bad things, too. And the movie actually explores that, you know. It's not just black and white. In, in a situation like that, both sides are going to play dirty. And the movie actually touches on that, which I think they did really, really well. Um... Like, one of the main characters is faced with some tough decisions. Uh, some decisions that, you know, could very much run contrary to another one of the main character's goals. Um, and, and he sort of grapples with it, and it's really interesting, and, and I think really engaging. But yeah, it's a slow build-up. The movie starts pretty slow, but all the exposition that's there, I think, is needed. I don't think you could cut anything out of, like, the slow parts or edit the movie down at all from where it is. Everything that's there needs to be there for one reason or another. But it, it starts slow, and then by the middle of the movie, it starts to really pick up, and then by the end, uh, the, the climax of the movie is one of the best climaxes in any Star Wars movie ever. And I think you'll be hard-pressed to find anyone who disagrees with me. They handled it so, so well. And uh, I was actually on the edge of my seat. It was, it was amazing. So, yeah, I mean, and it, it really feels like you're in the universe that George Lucas presented in episode four and five and six, but it's that, you know, kind of grungy, lived-in, nuts-and-bolts universe. Everything feels real. It doesn't feel shiny and green-screeny or blue-screeny like the prequels did, especially 2 and 3, when more than half the movie was actually shot on green screens and the sets were added in digitally. This has a very tangible feel to it. And practical effects will always usually win, you know, if you can do it. And they did. It, it flows seamlessly into episode 4, too. It is really well done in that regard. So, yeah, I mean, that's just... That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much I want to say that I can't without going into spoiler territory. If you guys really, really want, I can maybe uh, make a counterpart to this in the next day or so where we talk about some of the spoilers, but I just had to I just had to gush about how fun this movie was. So yeah, I would agree. It starts off slow, but it steadily builds up to this amazing crescendo. You know, bravo for that ending. It was so cool. Um, what else? Uh, the music was good. Uh, Michael Giacchino does the music in this one rather than John Williams, who, kind of like The Crawls, it seems like it's going to stick with the saga only. And that's fine. Uh, the man is getting on in years. And if you notice on his uh, IMDb, he hasn't been scoring as much as he used to. So the fact that he's still doing episode 8, which actually I guess he began scoring recently, is awesome. And Giacchino is a great composer. Um, so he, he, was a, he was a good person to step in. Um, however, I do feel like the movie did not, in terms of music, have any memorable motifs or, or themes that, you know, I leave the theater and I've got a new theme in my head that I'm humming or singing to myself, like I did with Force Awakens with the uh, Resistance theme. Uh, dun, dun, da, da, dun, 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 You know the one, you've seen it. Uh, I love that song. Uh, I think it's great. But yeah, Giacchino did an alright job, and you can tell he tried to make it... He added that 
William Z flair to it. You know, you could tell he was trying to emulate that Star Wars-y feel. So the music wasn't bad at all. It just wasn't... It wasn't, uh... It wasn't amazing. You know, I wouldn't say it was amazing. It, it did its job. The villain, the main villain uh, in the movie is an Imperial officer uh, named uh, Krennic. And he's really good. Uh, he's always fun to watch. And... Uh, some of his scenes are, are really good. He, he plays a really, really kind of an awful man. Um, but at the same time, you kind of feel for him because in the movie, things really kind of end up being stacked against him in terms of the imperial hierarchy. And you can see that he's struggling to sort of, you know, do his job, you know. So that, that was fun. Uh, man, I'm trying to think what else to say without accidentally letting a, a, any big spoilers. Uh, they, well, they actually are able to tie this into the prequels, too. Which, whether we love or hate the prequels, I actually really appreciate that they're still acknowledge, acknowledging them. But th there is a character uh, in the prequels who comes back uh, who's really important. He has to be in this movie. And it was good to see that they got the same actor and everything again, you know. I'm a sucker for consistency. So having that character back was, uh, you know, it was good. It was really good. Um, there are a lot of fan service moments in this. Like, you know, winks and nods, you know. If you see that thing or see that character, you know who they are, you know. You know, look who's in the movie. But it never felt like it was forced, you know. It always felt like... You know, it felt like it, it always worked. I mean, it wasn't gratuitous, I don't think. It, it only helped you feel uh, like you were back in this world. And, I mean, Force Awakens did a good job with that, too. But the thing with that movie is it takes place 30 years after Return of the Jedi, so it's a new era. Um, so it's bound to look and feel a little bit different. This one, as soon as it begins, I mean, you know you're in the Rebellion era, you know. Uh, it was brilliantly handled. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's not too much more I could really say. I, I give it a definite thumbs up. Uh, I had a lot of fun seeing this movie, even if my son fell asleep. I know if he had been awake when uh, the middle of the movie uh, started coming, you know, and everything started picking up, he would have enjoyed it a lot more. Uh, he missed some of the, the coolest parts. Uh, but, he, you know... I guess he didn't mind. He got his picture uh, taken with Darth Vader and a Stormtrooper after in the theater, so, you know, I think his day was, was good. So, yeah. Um, but that, the space battle in the movie, uh, it's on par with, like, Return of the Jedi, you know, space battle. Uh, but it's even more kinetic. They're able to do things that were a lot harder to do back in the 70s and 80s. I mean, you've got, um, you know, cameras on the wing, on the wing of an X-Wing. So, you know, you're, you're flying along with it, and you're, you're seeing, you know, ships crashing into each other, and but it, it doesn't feel... It doesn't have that sort of cartoony feel that the CG ships and stuff in the prequels had. Everything, even the CGI, feels really solid. Everything has mass to it. Uh, scale in the movie is masterfully handled with the Death Star and everything. Uh, the Death Star in this movie... Uh, another internet critic uh, sort of said it's almost like the One Ring. It's this, in you know, it's this, it's this dread you can feel throughout the whole movie, even more I dare say than than in Episode Four. But because we're sort of dealing with uh, sort of the backstory of the Death Star's construction and whatnot, you're able to learn more about the actual battle station and some of its capabilities, actually. Um, things it's able to do that we didn't know it could do. Uh, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's not a, not a, nothing huge. But just, you know, little things, little details. This movie is filled with little details, but they're all there um, to enhance the viewing experience. You know, it, it, the, uh, the filmmakers, uh, the director, and... Just everyone involved did a really good job bringing us back to, you know, circa episode four, uh, Star Wars Galaxy. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the direction was good, too. Speaking of the director, Gareth Edwards, who did the Godzilla remake, um, he got pretty good performances out of his characters. All the acting was really, really good in this movie. Really, really solid. Uh, like the whole movie, is, is solid is a, a good word for it. It's... Um, yeah, even like uh, chemistry between characters. I felt like while the characters weren't as likable as the the new leads that were introduced in The Force Awakens, they were still quite interesting, and I, I did grow to care for them. Some people said they didn't really care for the characters. Which, you know, I, I just don't understand. I think they did a good job, like I said, with the time they had to develop these p characters. Would I have liked to have known more about them, and would it have been better if they had had even more development? Sure. But this is a one standalone movie. We're never going to see these characters again, so they have to make, uh, not make do, but they have to utilize the time that they have really well, and they did really, really well. So, so yeah, I mean, whew. yeah, good movie. I sound really rambly right now. It's four in the morning. <laughs> so I meant to do this right after the movie and everything, but it's been a busy day, you know, Christmas shopping and whatnot, and it's just, uh, the tree fell down because the stupid cat knocked it over and I had to redo everything. So it's uh, been a while since I've been able to actually sit down and talk about this. So I apologize if, uh, if my stream of Star Wars consciousness is not the most coherent. But, uh... The climax, I have to go back to that. It was just the, uh, the sense of uh, urgency was palpable. Um, you know, near the very last moments of the movie, you know, my heart was thundering. I mean, you felt, you felt the, the, the urgency and the fear of, of, of the characters in the movie. It was one of those down-to-the-wire sort of last-ditch effort my god, I hope this works, kind of thing. So, uh, that was really, really, really handled well. Yeah, it's, it's really, you know, everybody keeps saying, and it's true, it's, it's a war movie. It's not warm and fuzzy like Star Wars can sometimes get. This is, you know, heroes pitted against terrible odds. Um... And, and it's like, imagine the Battle of Hoth on steroids. I mean, it's just crazy. This really is uh, a war, you know, Star Wars. And it also has kind of a sort of an espionage movie f feel about it. There's a lot of location jumping um, from, you know, exotic planet to exotic planet as the characters, you know, progress in the, their, their, you know, mission. Uh, and for some people that might get, you know, a little confusing because brand new worlds are being, you know, names are being thrown out left and right and whatnot, but I don't think it detracted or anything. Um, but I can understand why it might be slow for some people, especially younger people, until you get to the middle, you know, and especially near the end. So, pacing kind of slow, but it, it builds, and then you're glad it did, definitely. So, yeah, uh, Rogue One. Uh, surprisingly even better than I expected. I mean, from the trailers I started to get the hype. I was pretty excited to see this movie. But there's always that part of me that's a little unsure about these spin-off films. Uh, people are saying that by doing more movies other than the saga that uh, Disney or Lucasfilm, because it's not really Disney who are making these movies, they own Lucasfilm, but Lucasfilm is still making them, kind of like Marvel Studios is still making the Marvel movies, even though Disney owns Marvel Studios. But there's the feeling that a lot of people have, and a, a definite worry that by doing this, they're going to cheapen Star Wars. And, you know, it, I think it will eventually get to that point, since they, uh, and this is kind of Disney, because uh, they do eventually call the shots, you know, top of the, they're the top of the food chain still. They want a new Star Wars movie to come out every single year. So, you know, you're going to have a saga movie and then a spin-off and then a saga movie and then a spin-off and so on. And, and, you know, I don't know what they're going to do when Episode Nine's done. They'll probably keep making side stories if, if they can milk it for all it's worth. But as it stands right now, just Rogue One on its own, 
I don't feel like it cheapened Star Wars at all or detracted from it. I think, in fact, it enhanced Star Wars, especially Episode Four. So, yeah, I mean, that's really all I have to say right now without going into spoiler territory. Um, so, in summary, yeah, the characters, they're all fairly interesting, as interesting as they can be with the time they have. The pacing is slow, but it gets better. The effects are very impressive. The CG characters that they had to use CGI to create because there was no other way, while they don't look amazing, they're more than passable. So, yeah, really good movie. Will you like it better than The Force Awakens? It really depends. Most people I don't think will. If you're one of those people who either hated or found Force Awakens disappointing, uh, will you like this movie better? Well, the odds, um, well, they're high. So, yeah, if you get a chance, go and see it. It's well worth it. Force Awakens is probably better, depending on who you ask. I liked it better, but if I gave The Force Awakens, you know, four stars, which I did, maybe higher praise than it deserves, I don't know. I give it four stars. I give this one a three and a half, seriously. So, check it out.